Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Himmelstein, Tenant Advisory Group. Bill, thanks so much for joining us. Much appreciated. You bet, Tim. I, I appreciate you having me. I've been listening to a lot of your fireside chats over the last several months. And you've had all these amazing guests. I'm so confused on to why I'm here. But <laughs> we I, had I a last minute spot to fill. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Always in the plan. Uh, you know, I, Bill and I go back. When did we meet? To, I left corporate America 2016. I started having coffee with one. folks in Chicago. I think you were probably like, maybe the fourth or fifth or sixth person that I met back in 2016. So we're going on four years, man. So We've basically got like I college really years together. low bar. I was one of the early people. So it was a very low bar. <laughs> meetings with. Where was I spending my time those first four <laughs> or five or six coffee meetings? Jeez. Uh, but we, we go way back. I've, I've appreciated, you know, I've been on this entrepreneurial journey that the fireside Chicago ends have, have kind of heard about, listened about if, if you've been uh, listening to this, the show or going to the webinar series. Um, but I, I, I do honestly say, you know, I've learned so much from our conversations, from like watching you play the game. We're in like much different industries, but I think I always have a few takeaways every time we get together. And I think there's a lot of uh, value in that for me personally, if I'm being selfish, but I also appreciate that. And I also know we're going to get into it, how you, how you, uh, you know, bend over backwards for your clients and some of the partners that you have. So uh, for, for those that don't know you, Bill, um, maybe just give a high level on uh, yourself and, and your company, what you guys do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Bill Himmelstein, I'm the founder and CEO of a commercial real estate consulting firm called Tenant Advisory Group. What we do is we work with business owners, uh, CEOs, CFOs, you know, decision makers of companies to help them with their real estate needs, whether that means leasing space, um, expanding, contracting, buying or selling. The one thing that we don't do is represent landlords and help them lease up their buildings. We try to stay uh, on the tenant and buy side. I call it the end user. We work on behalf of the end user of commercial real estate. So uh, b business owners that are looking for their first space, new space to upgrade space. I'm thinking like, I don't know, maybe like the CFO uh, maybe involved in real estate, uh, HR, I, I don't know. Who, no, you're who, absolutely right. On, on, you know, if it's your first space, if it's, you know, you're ex you've got an existing space that's no longer working for you. If you're looking to get free rent or to terminate a lease, if you want to buy or sell a property, usually though, who we're dealing with Tim is, is usually that starts with the CEO, the president, the founder. Sometimes they might pass it off to the CFO, the COO, but for the most part, the level of businesses that we're dealing with, which usually have anywhere between, I'd say 20 employees on the low end and maybe a few thousand employees on the high end, it's usually in the hands of the CEO because this is, you know, real estate's typically like the second largest expense for a business and the CEO wants to have his finger on that pulse. So they're usually involved on that, in that. Yeah, uh, culture is a variable. Expense is a huge variable. Um, I, I think like what when I, when I met you, I think you were the first commercial real estate um, person that I've ever met. You know, I was like, oh, there's there's a commercial side to residential, like finding an apartment or buying your first house, and you know that kind of thing. It's a very very similar process that I've understand getting to know you and how you support your clients in that way. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's that's what's interesting about our industry is there. Not everybody knows that, you know, when you hire a broker to, to buy you, help you buy a house, the seller of that house is going to pay, let's call it a 6% commission, regardless of whether the buyer has a broker or not. Same thing in commercial real estate, that if you're looking to rent space, the landlord's going to be paying a full market commission. But if the tenant doesn't have representation on their side, the full commission is still paid. There is no savings to the tenant. In fact, I could make a very good argument that, you know, we're there to take money from the landlord and give it to the tenant. And we add a tremendous amount of value, approximately 10 times the value of our fee. So if our fee is going to be $50,000, I'm going to be able to add at least $500,000 worth of value to that client. Let, let's, let's focus on just you, you as a business owner. You know, you've been doing this a decade um, may, maybe talk about, and a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, just business savvy folks that really like, like to hear the origin story. What were you doing before? Why did you take this like crazy, scary jump into 
entrepreneurship and maybe talk about your journey along the way a little bit. You got it. Yeah. So I've been in business now for over almost 12 and a half years. Um, the eight years prior to that, I was working for some of the bigger commercial real estate firms, Cushman Wakefield, Equus, uh, John Buck. And for eight years, I enjoyed my work. I just didn't enjoy who I was doing it for. And, and really, it was about values and integrity. I never heard, you know, do what's right for your client. I never heard, well, you know, get out there and try and add value in whatever way that you can. I never heard, put your client's best interest first. All I heard was, make as much money as you can and step on anybody's throat you have to to get it. And I thought, boy, you know, I, I want to be wealthy. I want to make money, but I don't want to do it at other people's expense. I used to remember they, they yell at you. That's how they motivate you at the bigger firms is they yell at you and they say, Himmelstein, how are you going to get your piece of the pie? How are you going to get a bigger piece of the pie? They, and, and, you know, first of all, in their mind, it's a zero sum game. There's one pie. And for you to get more, someone else has to get less. For you to get a higher commission, your client has to pay more in rent. Uh, for you to get a higher commission, you have to fire the junior broker that brought in the deal. And yes, that happens. Um, I wasn't, those values did not align with mine. And I remember it was July 2008 and July 4th, I was playing golf with my father and I was telling him, I really enjoyed supporting people, helping businesses grow. But really the only way I was allowed to do that working at these bigger firms was through a transaction, through a real estate transaction, because that's how we're compensated transactionally. I get it. Um, but I wanted to take the time to build relationships, to, uh, to bring value, to refer business to my clients, to refer better service providers to my clients so they can run more efficiently. And so really what it came down to was I never drank the Kool-Aid at these bigger firms. I, I never, shared values with them because their value was make as much money as you can and step on anybody's throat you have to to get it my value was rather than takes from someone else so i can make more why don't we make a bigger pie so we all get more i want to be successful in conjunction with my clients not at their expense and so you know, we had touched earlier on about kind of what was those first years like and how did I get into it? You know, number one, when my, when my father first suggested I should start my own company, I was, my first thoughts were, oh, it's not the right time. I've got deals that I'm working on that I want to see closed. And he said, Bill, it's never the right time to start a business. You just got to do it. And so like, you know, like Nike says, just do it. I jumped in. Clearly, I, I made, you know, plenty of mistakes. I'm still making them today. But the key is never make the same mistake twice. Also, my father used to say, don't make a mistake that's so big that it, it puts you under. So obviously, <laughs> you got to think things through. But, you know, if you can learn from your mistakes, recover, and get better, then as time goes on, you're just going to get stronger and stronger. So, so really, for me, it was about building a company that mirrored my values, that supported my values, which were very, very simple. And I learned these from my competitors that didn't have these simple values. TAG has three core values. Do what you say you're gonna do, be responsive, and put your client's best interest first. None of those are reinventing the wheel, but sadly, uh, you know, I have a saying, God bless the competition. Just by doing the th those three things day in and day out, we vastly separate ourselves from our competitors. Commercial real estate and where I started my career, staffing, they're very, very similar in a lot of senses. Like they're, they're both brokerage businesses and any brokerage business, your sales organization has to be resilient and just out, out hustling the competition to get the deal because the, the, the buyer of the service can, can basically like use anybody they want right? So I feel like these organizations, at least the sales orgs, are very much how you described, like pound the phones, step over other people's toes. You know, the ones that really like grow and make it is, you know, they've done that over a long period of time at the expense of others, right? They have high attrition, 
the culture is bad. Glassdoor has given visibility to all this. Um, so it's when, when you talk about your early days in commercial real estate, it takes me back to, uh, you know, the, the days of staffing and, uh, you know, the, the differences among how you could be doing things versus what was successful in the past. Do you feel like that was a product of the times? Like, you know, you're, you're a little bit older than I am, but we're the same generation. I mean, like, like back then, pre, things were pretty hardcore than they are now. Or, or was that a product of the industry? Like, how, how would you, or, or maybe just the people you were working no, for? How would you I, categorize I that's a, that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the, the industry was, and in my understanding still is today, heavy cold call focused. You know, call random business owners, find out when their lease is expiring. If it's greater than two years, hang up the phone and get off. If it's within two years, tell them that you're the best broker and they need to hire you. And the first thing that I did when I started my company was I never picked up a phone. I've never cold called, still haven't to this day. And I don't have any of my sales team cold calling. What we're trying to do is leverage our relationships to get in front of the right people. And we do that. You know, a lot of people talk about networking and I'm not, so sure that that word has the right connotation to most people. I like to talk about connecting and saying, okay, Tim, you like to get in front of fast growing uh, tech B2B businesses. Great. Let me introduce you to some founders and CEOs of those businesses. I like to get in front of the same kind of companies or, you know, professional service firms or whomever it is. And it's just, it's about, you know, leveraging your network for the benefit of others, bringing them value, whatever it is their goals are, whatever their needs are, if you can fulfill that, whether it's your revenue generating activity or not, you now have built trust with that person. You now become a partner rather than a vendor. You're not trying to sell them something. You're trying to be a trusted advisor. And what better way to do that than by supporting the growth of their business, whether it's through referring new clients, bringing them to an event where they can meet new clients or introducing them to top service providers that can do a better job than their current providers. And that's I, what I our think, focus is. I, I think that was one of the, the big things I learned from you on how to, how you play the game early on and then how I could maybe kind of mirror some of those activities that you were doing. Yeah, you're right. Uh, commercial real estate, um, staffing, recruitment, uh, B2B, SaaS, you know, all of these sales orgs, the sales process is pick up the phone. Yeah, maybe do some targeting and some research, but pick up the phone, hit them with some messaging, you know, 70 touches to a sale, like run yourself into opportunity. And I feel like, you know, when we're talking about generational gaps, back when we started in the industry, people would pick up the phone and they, they had to like find vendors that way. Like, okay, like maybe I'll give you a shot. Like I'll give you five minutes that kind of stuff happened. Now the, the buyers are buying differently. They are doing a ton of research online. They're not picking up the phone. I, I don't know about you. When I open up my inbox, the first thing I do is find all the sales emails. I hit delete and then I go, okay, now which ones do I need to look at and get back to? Right. Buyers are doing things differently now. So when I, when I left corporate America, my vision was to start a recruitment and staffing company. And I had a two and a half year non-compete, as you know, and I became a sales consultant. And uh, I'm so glad that I stumbled across you and others around this, you know, this, yeah, networking is not the right word, but, you know, connecting others and providing value to others, not expecting anything in return. But, you know, over, over the long haul, if you're doing this right, people will look at Bill and say, you know, hey, I do have a commercial real estate need. Or they'll look at Tim and say, hey, I need sales consulting support or now recruitment support. And uh, that, that was a big learning lesson for me. When I met Bill, when I met you, you know, the first thing you did would say, was say, how can I help? There now, why am, I, why am I wasting time talking to you? You can't provide me anything right now. You don't know anybody. All your, all your contacts are at your other company. You said, how can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm trying to kill two and a half years as a sales consultant. I want to meet business owners. And you introduced me to like 10. And that, that kind of like got things started. That helped pack my calendar a little bit. And then once I met other people, you know, I found like they said the same thing. And there was a theme of people just want to help other people out. 
and they want to help people that they know out and others that they know who they know out. So leveraging that concept, but also practicing what you expect from others first uh, is a big, big pickup from you. So maybe, maybe elaborate on that for people. I don't know if I'm explaining that well, but it was, it was a no, huge learning I, lesson for me. First of all, I appreciate you bringing that up. And, and, you know, those questions, how can I help you? What can I do to support you? Um, you know, it, it, you quickly remove that vendor hat and you're putting on the partner hat. And um, I think when you can support someone else in achieving their goals, it's, it's impactful to them. It's memorable to them. And so, you know, I really don't even talk about real estate. To me, the price of admission of just having a business, you should be really good at what you do. And for us, you know, I have 94 client testimonials on our website. Now we're finally starting to get those folks to put them on Google and Facebook. But my point is, the three, the big three commercial real estate firms, Cushman, CB, Jones Lang, they have a combined total of zero testimonials on their website. So I don't need to go around telling people I'm good. I've got many, many clients that'll do that. Cranes in 2017, the last time they ran this, uh, nominated me as the top commercial real estate broker in Chicago. So the accolades, the, the customer uh, feedback, that's all there. I don't need to go around talking about how good I am. What I like to talk about are other people's businesses and what's working, what's not working. Where can I plug in people from my network to either support solving of a problem, you know, getting a better service provider. And most importantly, what most business owners are thinking of most of the time is top line revenue. I need more, you know, that tends to solve a lot of problems in getting more business. Um, and if I can be that person that leads to, um, a new client for them or puts them in a room where they meet a bunch of potential new clients. Um, it really doesn't matter what my product or service is. When that item or ticket comes up, they're going to call me. I mean, I never before when I worked for these other companies and I was cold calling and not really building deep relationships, no one ever was super excited to work with me. Like you said earlier, oh, I'll give them a shot. Let's see how it goes, you know, or fine. This guy's called me 50 times in the last month. He's very persistent. Maybe he'll be that dogged going after the landlords for me. Now, most people, you know, they'll come to me and say, Bill, our lease is coming due in about a year. Uh, we need help thinking through that. Is that something you can help us with? And when I say yes, they're so excited to be able to, to work with me because of that relationship. And so I think another good way to put it in perspective, Tim, when the, the, the bigger commercial real estate firms, their brokers typically do five to seven transactions a year. Maybe a busy one does 10. Um, we had an off year last year. It was a, we, a little slow. Uh, we worked on about 35 transactions. Typically, like this year, we're going to do over 40. Um, you know, we're usually in that 40 transaction range, and that's exponentially greater I didn't ask any of those clients, hey, when's your lease coming due? How much space do you have? You should consider working with me because I'm the best. I didn't say that to any of them. Now, I have a newsletter. I have social media. We'll put out there things about the market. I've been releasing a video blog during the pandemic about what's happening in the market and things like that. Um, but when I'm engaged with somebody, either one-on-one, -on, -one, on the phone, in a, in a group setting, I'm not asking them about their real estate needs. I'm asking them about their business. Who are their ideal clients? That's a wonderful question to ask somebody aside from what can I do to support you? How can I best help you? You know, who in my network is, would be helpful for you to meet, but you know, who are your ideal clients? Oh, you like working with law firms? Great. I've got 85 managing partners that know me well, will take my call. I've referred most of them business. So I don't want to say that they owe me, but if I make an introduction, they're going to pick up the phone sure. and they're going to respond. And so when I'm introducing that person, they go, wow, Bill just introduced me to a managing partner I've been trying to get in front of for a year. And with one introduction from him, I now have a meeting with this guy, you know, and that's to me, it has, so that, I guess, mentality, that approach to business development has nothing to do with commercial real estate. 
has nothing to do, you know, with, with placement. It doesn't matter what you're doing, but it does matter how you're doing it. And that's really where we focus on. Uh, I, I just think it, it's fun. You know, I, I enjoy getting to know other people. I like, I, I like supporting others. Uh, a good day for me is just pre-COVID, back-to-back coffee meetings all day. You know, maybe breakfast with somebody, a couple of coffee meetings, a lunch, a couple more coffee meetings, answer some emails, a drink with somebody, head on the train home. I really enjoy doing that. And you're right, there's, there's no cold calling if your focus is how can I support others. Now, if a listener is trying to get takeaways, I think you have to evaluate what value you could provide. So Bill, 12 years into his business, you know, meeting everybody across town, knows a lot of people, can make introductions. I'm four and, a, four, four and a half years into this journey. I know some folks, you know, so for me, I think like, oh, I could give maybe a family member some free uh, job search advice, or uh, I can make connections to potential new hires for free, even though that's a service that I charge people for. Or to your point, I can find other business opportunities or other targets by asking for that ideal client profile for someone that I'm meeting with and see if I can make a connection for them. You know, something of value, not so they owe you, but you're doing it in goodwill. And if you do it over the long haul, good things are going to return to you. And I think uh, another takeaway that I've picked up over time is I think you have to be smart about two things. One is you have to be crystal clear when you get asked the question, how can I help or who can I introduce you to? You have to be crystal clear and tight on who that is. So before it was like, I'll meet anybody. I'm just like, my network is very small. I'll meet anybody. And I think that's a good place to start. But then you find yourself, you know, uh, meeting with people that you cannot provide value to. And then in a sense, they can't provide value in in reverse, right? So I think that's, that's kind of number one. And then number two, I think you just got to be smart with your time. And if you can combine both of those, smart with your time, meaning, you know, meet with people that you can provide value to that could yield that return. And if you could do 100%. both those things, you know, there's, there's a lot of success in a very fun, enjoyable sales process for the right person. Yeah, I agree 100%. I, 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 like you, enjoy getting out there, meeting people, learning how I can support them, and then doing that. The big question I get from early stage entrepreneurs is, if my network's not as robust as yours, you know, if, if, if I have a relationship with a thousand business owners, and they might know too. How do they get started? How do they get involved in networking and connecting? And the answer is simple. You know, join a networking group. My first group I joined was BNI, Business Networking International. And what I, you know, for me, their, their, uh, I guess, slogan, their, their, you know, go-to phrase is, um, uh, shoot, it's giver's game. So, Mm meaning the more you give, the more you get back. And the, what I learned from them, first of all, was that they're a very B to C driven organization. They've got plumbers and painters and hairstylists and people like that. And I'm not saying that they're not good people, but what I realized was that business owners who need a new accountant or attorney or banker, are not going to go to their HVAC guy or their drywall guy. Mm. They're going to go to their banker, attorney, or accountant to find out who they should be talking to. So, you know, I've got three steps to networking to find a good networking partner. You know, number one is you've got to share similar values. That's most important. Meaning if you run across somebody that, you know, and I use the example in my industry, a lot of the business development tactics are, I'll take them to a, a state dinner, or I'm going to take them to a strip club, and that's how we're going to bond. That's not me, you know, but if, and if I talk to someone that doesn't form a close relationship with their clients, or doesn't care about doing right by their clients, we're not sharing those same values. So sharing similar values is one. Number two is, do we work with similar clients? So Tim, if you had said to me, yeah, I'm going after fortune 500 companies, there's not much I can do to help you. Those aren't my clients. I can't introduce you to those people. Um, But when you say I'm going after small, medium sized businesses that are 
growing fast, you know, and in typical, you know, I like tech companies. Great. Me too. All right. We now have similar clients. And the third one is, this is a little bit trickier to find out, but does that networking partner of yours serve as a trusted advisor? Meaning when they make an introduction, does the other person respond? So like I was just talking to someone today, has a lot of clients, but they're not hers. Someone else is handing her the work. So she can't make introductions to clients because the clients don't really know she is, you know, she doesn't have the relationship with the client. So she might have a great book of, you know, stuff that she's working on, but she doesn't have the relationship. So I, I flat out told her, look, I'm happy to introduce you to any managing partner that you like. And I'd happy to be checked through your connections to see if you have any that you can introduce me to, but I just don't think this is going to be a great long-term fit. So, Starting off, back to that original point of starting off networking, get into a networking group, meet other trusted advisors. So if you're an accountant, you might want to meet other estate planning attorneys and business corporate attorneys and bankers, you know, uh, ins insurance, but whoever it might be. But then what you do over time is as you meet more and more business owners, what I call is leveling up. I used to be incredibly dependent on waiting for my networking partners to refer me into a, a transaction. Now I've leveled up to, I meet with business owners all the time instead of service providers and I'm networking with those business owners. So the business owners, not only could they be a potential client, but they're also introducing me to other business owners because that's what I'm doing with them. So when you can get to the point where, yeah, it's still important for me to have great service providers, but I spent such a huge chunk of time meeting, you know, 50 accountants and 50 bankers and hundreds of attorneys. By the way, I will say in general, attorneys in general are not good networking partners. That's just been my experience. They don't know how to reciprocate. They oftentimes don't know how to make an introduction. They look at those relationships as scarcity. I don't want to introduce Bill because what if he messes it up and that'll hurt my relationship. Whereas you and I, Tim, we have a mindset of abundance. If I can introduce my client to Tim, it's only going to help my client. My client's going to be better off if they can meet Tim, you know? And so I think the key is you start with the service providers, you meet as many as you can, you make introductions for each other. You, then you start getting in front of your potential clients because that's the ultimate goal is you want to get in front of as many potential clients as you can. And then at some point, you're not going to need to rely on other service providers to refer you business because you already have a huge network of business owners and eventually they're all going to cycle through and have a need for your services. And if you've done a good job in building those relationships, adding value and supporting the growth of those business owners, businesses, you'll have more business than you know what to do with. I think there's a lot of takeaways that I've taken from you over the years, but I think listeners who are aspiring business owners, current business owners, um, you know, just looking to pick up sales tactics could take a lot away from this. I think the first thing is if you want to start a business, just get started. You know, there's not a good time to do it. Just would, would you say before this Nike, Nike, just, just, just do, do it. it. Uh, the second thing is, you know, as the business owner, you have to be, you have to be the first sales rep. You have to be marketing the business, evangelizing the business good sales activity is talking to people. And at first just talk to, talk to anybody <laughs> that'll listen, but be perfectly clear with who you're trying to meet. And humans are human. It's humanity. They're looking to help other people out, especially those that are just starting out and taking a risk. Um, so lots yeah. lots of takeaways there. I want to make sure we touch on commercial real estate. We're recording this post COVID, let's say. Um, COVID's changed a lot of things. Econ uh, economics wise, uh, anything, uh, sh job market related. I mean, we're seeing huge waves in the recruitment industry. Um, we went from a low unemployment environment to a high unemployment environment. It's changing the dynamic between employers and employees. It's changing the way that, uh, employees see work and how employers see getting employees on the bus to uh, perform that work. It's changing a lot of different things. I think there's a lot of assumptions that could be made uh, around Chicago being an urban area and having a big suburban area, but uh, what's going on out there? <laughs> I've, we haven't caught up in a long time. What, what is the, the market saying out there? 
So it's obviously, it's been very interesting. There's been a lot of changes. Never in the 20 years that I've been doing commercial real estate has their a company's lease or space needs been on the mind of every single business owner. And so from that respect, you know, everyone's thinking about what's the right thing to do. How do we come back to the office safely? You know, um, it's very, very important to take anything that you read or hear in the media um, in context. Most people don't understand the proper context. And I'll give you an example. You know, I have a lot of people reaching out, Bill, there's 8 million square feet of space on the market, of sublease space on the market. And that's the most we've ever had. The world, the commercial real estate's over, right? There's gonna be no more office space for, we don't need it anymore, right? Like this must be catastrophic to you. I say, all right, you know, reading something in cranes that says there's 8 million square feet of sublease space on the market, uh, in office space in downtown, and that's the most we've ever had. Yeah, that can sound pretty startling. But when you put that up against, you know, put it in context and say, well, we have 210 million square feet of office space in downtown Chicago. So 8 million square feet, which by the way, hasn't all come onto the market since COVID started, that represents three and a half percent uh, percentage points of vacancy rate, okay? Now I've had other people say, Bill, you know, I bet you we get to 40% vacancy. You know, really, what, how do you think that? You know, um, one thing they'll say is, well, no one's coming back. They're never gonna come back to the office. They all wanna you know, work remotely. And I say, well, I've spoken to well over 250 business owners since the start of the pandemic and two, have said they're never coming back. One is going out of business. They're not coming back to anything. And the other one already had one foot out the door. They were in strange locations and didn't really value office space. But what I say to everybody is, look, why was office space important pre-COVID? The answers are team building, culture, collaboration, socialization, things like that. Those four things are extremely difficult to get in a remote environment. There are going to be a lot of companies that try to do remote working. I'm not even going to say a lot. There will be a, a, a few percentage wise. Percentage wise, there'll be a few companies that try it. What they're going to learn is when you have an entirely remote workforce, um, you're not going to have a strong culture. Your team building is very difficult. Collaboration is very difficult. You're gonna have higher turnover, and as you know better than anyone else, turnover costs money. You gotta hire, you gotta train. You don't want turnover, uh, especially from your you know, A players, your top team members. So there's very few companies that I've spoken with that have said, we're no longer gonna have office space. That's something that you read in the paper. You know, you know these, these media organizations have to sell their content. So now we talk about eight, 8 million square feet of sublease space on the market. We're now at a total vacancy rate inclusive of subleases of just under 13%. Now, again, you could read and say, wow, we're 13%. That sounds huge. Let's put it into context. The last two recessions, the dot-com bubble and the financial crisis, we saw uh, in, the, in the depths of those recessions, we saw vacancy rates anywhere from 17 to 18%. This is, we're talking about downtown office space. So at 17 or 18%, landlords are dropping their rental rates a couple bucks a foot. Uh, they're adding more TI and they're adding uh, more free rent. 12 and a half percent is typically thought of as equilibrium where neither the landlord nor the tenant has a distinct advantage. We're just under 13%. We're not far from equilibrium. We're on the side of tenant favorable. Uh, but landlords, you know, even with that 8 million square feet of sublease space, those subtenants are still paying their rental rate. So landlords are not in a dire situation. Um, I, I read something recently that landlords are still collecting 97% of their rent. So landlords are not, direct landlords at least, are not there handing out 50% of rental rates pre you know, to pre-COVID. Where you can find some opportunities are in subleases. Now, again, the reader looks and says, 8 million square feet of sublease space? Well, for my 5,000 square foot business, I should be able to find 
thousands of them. Not true. When you look at, say, Groupon, subleasing 150,000 square feet, they're not carving out a 5,000 square foot chunk for your business. They're looking for 75,000 square feet, 150,000 square feet. So really, the only subleases that are going to apply to you are the ones that are 5,000 feet, maybe a 10,000 square foot sublease will subdivide, although it's rare. But what you need to find if you're looking for a good sublease is space that lays out exactly the way you want it because sub landlords don't do build out allowances. They go, here's our space. If it works for you, great. If not, go find something else. You also need to find the right term. So if you're willing to sign a three year lease, but the term is only one year, is it really a benefit to get a, a huge break in rent, but you got to move twice in a year? Um, so you need to find space that lays out exactly the way it works for you. You need to find the right size and you need to find the right term. So I've had a lot of that right now there's a huge disconnect between what the tenants and buyers think the market should be and what the market actually is. Mm. Um, you know, those subleases that are priced aggressively with a longer term. Yeah, those are going immediately. Those are going really quickly, but for subleases that maybe have a really short term left, you know, 18 months or less, people don't want to have to move their businesses twice in, in, 12 to 18 months. Um, so it's not as easy as, well, there's 8 million square feet of subway space. I ought to, uh, I should be able to find a, a ton of deals. It doesn't work that way. And plus, like I said, the landlords, they're still getting paid on that space. So it's not like, you know, I had a friend of mine say recently, he thinks that we're going to see 40% vacancy rates. And I just laughed. I was like, based on what? Like there's, there's nothing traumatic happening right now. There really isn't. Are there some deals to be had? Sure. Are there opportunities to try and negotiate some free rent from your landlord? Yes, there is. But is a direct landlord who had rental rates of $40 a foot pre-COVID doing deals at 20? 100% no. Mm. They might not even be down to 35 a foot. They might be at 38, but maybe they'll add an extra month of free rent and maybe an extra $5 a foot in TI. But we have not seen the effects yet of COVID. And you know, just because companies are working from home doesn't mean that they're not still paying rent on their office space, nor does it mean that they're not gonna come back to the office when it's safe to do so. So I just, you know, I get, I get a lot of calls that are, this must be crazy and no one's ever gonna come back to the office. And you know, why can't I get, you know, I, I remember right the first week of COVID, I had a client of mine say, uh, Bill, Remember that space where they offered us 12,000 a month in rent? Why don't we offer them four? And I said, that's a great idea if you never want them to talk to you again, you know? Um, but you're not gonna see 75% off. You're not gonna see 50% off. I think we'll be lucky. And by we, I mean the tenants. Uh, you know, remember all this is good for tenants. Vacancy is good for tenants. So for the people I represent, you know, companies downsizing or, um, you know, adopting a, a work from home policy, not needing as much space, that's good for the rest of the tenants. But also keep in mind, here's another good statistic. 20 years ago, when I started in commercial real estate, the average square feet per person in office space in downtown Chicago was 470 square feet per person. Fast forward to pre-COVID, the average square feet per person in downtown office space was 190. So we've had this huge push for density. Jam as many people as you can into as small a space as you can. That trend is gonna reverse. People are gonna now have more square feet per person because they realize when someone sneezes, other people can get sick. So they're gonna start putting more space in between you know, their, their people. Now they're gonna be taking more square feet per person. They might be adopting a work from a flexible work from home policy, um, but if you ever want all your people to come in, maybe you take the, um, you know, the the business, you know, the buildings conference room or something like that. But really, with both sides of the coin here, being some companies are downsizing, some companies are subleasing their space, and maybe if they sublease fifty thousand feet, they're going to go take twenty five thousand feet somewhere else. Well, it's only a net loss of 25,000 feet. 
you know, so we're talking half, you know, the net absorption rate is very telling and net absorption, there hasn't been a huge change. So there's just this disconnect right now between supply and demand, what the tenant thinks the deal should be and what the landlord thinks the deal should be. And until the landlord really starts feeling the pain and having vacancy rates in their building go from 96% down to, you know, 80%, and we're a very, very long way away from that, they're not going to be dropping their rental rates. Now, a, a, a subtenant, a sub landlord, right, who's got some space they're trying to get rid of, they might offer a good deal. But remember, there's a lot of factors that have to match up exactly for a tenant to like that sublease space and take it. Yeah, the, the commercial real estate market is interesting. And I love microeconomics, macroeconomics. And I look at, you know, the labor market, which I'm a little bit closer to, the residential real estate market, and then the commercial real estate market. It's almost like a spectrum. The job market with this was a leading indicator. It got hit immediately, right? Uh, COVID hit, uncertainty happened, financial... Um, financial issues happened and then layoffs happened like almost immediately started with the small business sector crept into the mid mid market and then still fortune 1000s are doing layoffs right now residential market you need a you need a seller to like make a decision to sell right so like if you're a if you buy a house and you buy it for $300,000 and you, in your mind you're like I'm not losing money on this it's going to take it, a lot of market dynamics and a lot of time for that person to get to the point you mentioned the landlords very similar to go wow i need to take 250 on this just to get out of it and commercial real estate has this dynamic of like long term contracts so covid might come and go before like major dynamics hit in your industry you're spot um, on now there's still, here's what I get concerned about being so pro Chicago. I was raised here. I started a business here. I'm not going anywhere. My family's here. We need, we need COVID to pass for people to go downtown again and invest money in the, the restaurants and the local businesses and the vibe and everything that made the city great again. And I think that that needs to happen soon. You know, my industry bounced back in a lot of senses because people figured out how to hire people remotely, you know, few, <laughs> you know, for, and few for the candidates that got laid off. It, things are picking up. Um, if you're listening to this and you're looking for a job, things are picking up. And to your point, the commercial real estate market, the dynamics are what they are. Like I'll be looking for space soon. Like I need a home base for my, my company at, at some point. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are thinking the same way, even though that might look a little bit different, but it's just, it's just amazing. The, the, the variables that are at play based, based on these industries and how COVID has had an impact on a lot of different things. A hundred percent. And you know, the, like you said, the things are in commercial real estate are a lot slower to have to feel the impact. And, and by the time, you know, there may be an impact COVID could be over and we're looking at economic expansion again. But I think the big question is, you know, and, and there's a lot written about this about, are companies going to adopt these work from home policies? Are they going to be remote companies? And most of the research will show that that's not the best way to attract and retain top talent. Like for, for sure, if you have a remote company, you can hire people from anywhere. Your talent pool skyrockets. The same is to be said for the talent. They don't just have to look at Chicago. They can look anywhere in the country as well or the world for that matter. And so, what I believe is going to happen is there will be a lot of companies that will experiment with a, a broader work from home policy and potentially some will try and go fully remote. Um, but there's been so much research done, you know, what Peter Drucker said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, culture is very hard, you know, it's very hard to build a top culture with a fully remote team. Now, productivity numbers might be there in terms because these people are at home with nothing else to do. You can't go to the restaurants, you can't go to the bars, you can't take your kids to Chuck E. Cheese. Like when all you are is at home, you've got 
Netflix and work. So I think, yeah, people are working more, but that's not necessarily good for your team members because your team's more productive doesn't mean you're going to be able to retain that talent. You yeah, know what right. I mean? The, the research shows that the majority of people do not want a fully remote environment. The research also shows that they don't want to be 100% in the office either, but they yeah. prefer a day or two a week flexibility. And I think leadership is starting to, especially like folks that come from old school industries like yourself and myself, and uh, you know, folks that were, that built cultures in an era where there just wasn't as much flexibility or some of the, the tools that we have today to do remote work um, might, might have been open-minded now to the idea of like, hey, this is great. Like I can go to my kid's t-ball game. But I think, I think you're right. Like I would be concerned going up against a company that has everybody in one location and they're ringing a bell every time they make a sale, they're high-fiving each other, they're building like really good relationships. What, what I've found, and a lot of my team members are remote, so I have a, a whole different view on this, but um, my, my view is the, the breakup conversation from the labor pool is so much easier right now. Like, look, companies are onboarding people without meeting them in person. You know, you're at your, your house and you're doing work stuff and you're meeting people on Zoom and your, your expectations are kind of keep your head down and do work stuff. When adversity hits or if something's not right or that company's not pulling you in, which was a hell of a lot easier to do in person in an office, go out to lunch, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings your first month, you know, we'll go to happy hour together. All that stuff is, is, is gone. So when employees feel that pinch, of this isn't right and what could have been overcome by a conversation with a leader or pulling a friend at work aside and you know venting or whatever <laughs> that stuff's not there and i think you know we've seen people that we've placed bounce 10 days in 30 days in you know at statistics statistically more uh, exponentially more than we've seen before. And I think it's for that reason, which is another effect that this whole thing is having on this. 100%. And then another big thing, you know, you're absolutely right for having that, those social connections at the office keeps you, keeps your people more loyal. Well, I don't want to leave because I've got these great relationships at work, but another big component that you don't get from at home, uh, an at home environment is think about when I, like when I was younger and I would shadow my mentors and just be around them or I'd ask them questions or that you don't get that. You don't have your younger employees spending time with your more senior employees. And, and there's none of that thought leadership is being transferred to the younger generation. I think this working remotely is awful for younger, newer employees that are trying to learn the business and trying to learn what's going on. You just, it's so much easier if you can, be next to your boss while he's making a phone call or you go to that with your boss to lunch and just hear how she talks yeah. to the potential client or, you know, just shadowing more senior executives to hear how they interact and what they're saying and learn from them. You can't get that remotely. So there's a huge knowledge transfer that's not happening. That's not good for the longevity of companies to not be able to transfer that knowledge to, to the younger generation. Hit settings, sales organizations, high-fiving each other, new person sits across from the senior person, customer service, creative jobs where there's a lot of collaboration and office space was set up in a way to have collaborative rooms or take a call and, you know, in this way. And, you know, the, the shift from cubicles and single manager offices to the open setting, you know, all, all that stuff, there's... The, years and years and years of research to, to, to prove that we're missing out on that in a remote environment. And Hey, listen, like I'm, I'm for sure making the case that flexibility needs to happen. Otherwise you're going to lose people, you know, especially as they grow and especially as they got in the taste for this, but I'm, I'm with you. You're losing a lot of opportunity. If you just never go back to the office, there's going to be huge challenges there. Hey, Bill, I, I appreciate this, man. You know, um, I just looked at the time. We're like way, way over. And I think uh, it's just because I got so consumed in the conversation with you, like I always do. 
Um, and I ramble. I ramble a lot. I'm not going to lie. So I apologize for that. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. I've enjoyed this. It's always a pleasure. Likewise. If, uh, if I don't know, a listener wants to reach out to you, learn more about you or your company, where can they do so? Yeah, I mean, uh, my LinkedIn profile, Bill Himmelstein, or our website, tag commercialbroker.com. We just redid our website, so I'm really proud of it. Uh, but we've got a lot of great information, just what's happening in the market, how you can take advantage of things, um, all sorts of stuff. So yeah, feel free to check us out. We're always happy to have a conversation with anybody. And if we can't be the right resource, we will at least get them to the right resource for them. Love it, Bill. Much appreciated. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me.